So in this video, we're going to look a little bit closer at standing waves, trying to get a, more, a better feel, a better understanding of what they really are. So imagine that we have two solid blocks, very heavy, and we attach a string to that block, and we put that string under tension T, and this, of course the string has a certain amount of mass, it has length L, so it has a mass per unit length mu, and so we know then that any wave traveling on that string will have a velocity equal to the square root of the tension over mu. So that's a given. We also know that the velocity is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. So what determines the frequency and the wavelength? Well, the fact that it's hemmed in right here um, gives it some limitations. So what we can do now is take the string at the very center point and pull it down and then let go. So by doing that, we command the string to vibrate in such a way that the two endpoints, of course, are fixed because it's attached to these blocks right here. And since we pulled it down at the very center, it will start swinging up and down just like that. And the string will just keep going up and down and up and down and up and down like that. Which means, if you think about it, if this is part of the wave and we, in our imagination, continue on like that, then we realize that this would be the distance of a full wavelength, as I indicated right here, which means that the length then is only half a wavelength. So what we did then is, by setting it up like this, we commanded the wave to vibrate in such a way that the length of the string is half the wavelength, or the wavelength is then, of course, the corollary, <coughs> excuse me, is that the wavelength is, of course, twice the length of the string. So since we know the velocity, determined by the tension and mass per unit length, since we now have dictated the wavelength by pulling on the string at a particular location so that it vibrates like that, then we also can then from that figure out the frequency, which is of course this velocity by the wavelength we've given the string. All right, but that's not really what we're after right now yet at this moment. What we're going to do here is imagine for a moment that here we have a wave and think of this as a wave moving to the right with velocity v that then hits this barrier. Now that's a hard barrier. If the barrier wasn't there, the wave would simply just continue like this. But since the barrier is there, it will reflect off the barrier. It will hit the barrier and come back in the other way. But since the density of the barrier is greater than the density of the string, and since the string is attached to the barrier so it can't flop up and down, when it goes in the opposite direction, there will be a 180 degrees phase shift. So we have a phase shift at this location. So instead of going on the way it would, and then simply coming back the other direction like this, what is going to happen is that it's going to reflect back and flip 180 degrees. So it's going to reflect back as if it goes in this direction. Now flip that over so you realize now that the wave will continue back in this direction and be completely superimposed on the wave that was traveling in this direction. So now we have two waves on top of each other which then develops what we call a standing wave pattern. So what we end up with is we end up with really in essence two waves traveling in the opposite direction that have no phase shift difference because the phase flip here, the phase shift here, they're now in sync but simply traveling in the opposite direction, which means that the two wave, wave equations can be expressed as y1 equals to a times the sine of kx minus omega t, and let's call this wave 1, and wave 2 can be expressed as a times the sine of kx plus omega t. So the only difference is that they move in opposite directions. If we combine those two waves, we can then say that y1 plus y2 is equal to 2 times the amplitude times the sine of kx times the cosine of omega t. Notice again that the sine is only dependent on position, the cosine is only dependent upon time. So if we ignore the cosine for a moment, because what the cosine will do is simply bounce uh, between values of 1 to 0 and to negative 1 and back and forth and back and forth. So this is simply a multiplier of the 2a. The sine actually determines what the amplitude can be as a function of position. Now if we take x to be equal to 0, the sine of 0 is 0, that's this point right here. Notice that the amplitude can never be anything but 0 at this endpoint. If we now go over to the other side, where we have x is equal to lambda over 2, a half a wavelength, then notice when I plug in x equals lambda over 2, hmm, and what is k equal to? k is 2 pi over lambda, so let's figure that out again. So we have k, which is 2 pi 
over lambda. And if I go k times x, and in x I'm going to replace x by lambda over 2, then kx is going to be equal to 2 pi over lambda times lambda, whoop, I, I say lambda and write pi, that happens sometimes. So uh, lambda over 2, then lambda cancels out, 2 cancels out, and I'm left with pi. So if I replace x by pi over 2, which uh, lambda over 2, which is a half a wavelength, then notice that kx will equal just pi, and of course the sine of pi is 0, which means that the amplitude at this end of the string can also never be other than 0. And then we can only have maximum amplitude down to 0 determined by the, where did I go? Right here, determined by this portion of the function right here, which is simply a multiplier to the amplitude. Notice the maximum amplitude, this will be 2a, and so what happens is that once you plug and the, and the wave starts going back and forth, the amplitude will increase to twice the direction. If so if this was A, then this here will be 2A. So you have a much greater amplitude because of the wave feeding each other going back and forth. But that's really the hallmark of a standing wave, and that's why a standing wave occurs. It's simply a wave traveling left to right, hitting a barrier, coming back, but since it hits this barrier right here and it goes through a phase shift instead of coming back like this it comes back on top of the wave that traveled from left to right the one from right to left travels on top of it it amplifies becomes twice as high in amplitude and then you see the wave together going up and down like that and so you end up with a standing wave kinda something that looks like that and hopefully that will give you additional understanding of what a standing wave is